We are webcasting from the Johannesburg Institute for Advanced uh, Studies. You will see that some of us are here. Uh, we are respecting social distancing, so don't worry, we have all the precautions. Um, we are delighted to have with us, uh, he's not here physically with us, uh, but I believe he's not too far from us, he's in Joburg. Uh, Dr. S Scott Tinker, I hope I'm pronouncing it correctly. Uh, we never met in the flesh, so we have been corresponding uh, for, for quite some time. Uh, Dr. Tinker uh, has degrees um, from the University of the Witwatersrand, so I understand that he hails from South Africa and then from Canada, from Simon Fraser University. Between 2016 and 2019, uh, he was lecturing in the Caribbean uh, at the University of the West Indies in Trinidad and Tobago. I understand that he still has a connection with the Caribbean, with the uh, uh, Institute in Cuba, and is also involved with the uh, UN African Institute for Economic Development and uh, Planning. Um, the topic of today's book uh, is a topic that he has further elaborated in a book that has just come out for Bristol University Press. And the title of the book is Algorithms and the End of Politics 2021. And before that, he published a book titled Capital State Empire 2017 for University of Westminster Press. And colleagues in my discipline will know that it was published uh, for the series edited by Christian Fuchs. Uh, for University of Westminster uh, Press, uh, which kinds of suggest that uh, uh, Dr. Scott Tinker is a bit of a Marxist or has uh, <laughs> uh, um, radical political leanings, which we like very much here at Jayas. Um, 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 and uh, without any further ado, it's over to you, Scott. Oh, thank you for that uh, lovely introduction. Uh, you've made me sound better than what I am. Um, so I'm just loading up my slides over here, and uh, we can then uh, get going. Um, as sort of Pierre sort of pointed out, uh, I've published this book uh, from Bristol University Press on algorithms and the end of politics. Um, it's fundamentally uh, about contemporary affairs, uh, how and what are the, sort of the grander transformations that are occurring. So it sort of has this law, has this aspiration to uh, take a step back from the past of politics more broadly, and uh, seeks to address these sort of wider concerns. Um, before we jump in, I did want to uh, provide just a quick snapshot of some acknowledgements over here. Um, as everyone knows, a book is always originates out of a community of practice. And sort of they've been colleagues within Canada, the United States, Britain, uh, the Caribbean, who have all contributed in their different ways to this product. Okay. Um, I, would, I want to provide a little bit of a background to the types of concerns that I'm uh, working with today, we're going to talk about today. Um, as sort of Pierre sort of mentioned, in 2017, I published a book called Capital State Empire and tried to sort of address how sort of American warfare is changing? What is the nature of conflict and constraints? And how does capitalism guide and direct these elements? So to pick it up on a concept that others have been working with, I'm trying to think through the imperial mode of living and specifically the American imperial mode of living. Um, and I come to this from a Southern perspective, sort of using Southern theory. While also a lot of my work is uh, organized through Western Marxism, it's equally organized through Black Marxist categories too. Uh, those that are sort of originated in the Pan-Africanist movement, so on and so forth. So these are the types of lenses I'm bringing to the study of, of the American empire, very much sort of a Southern perspective. Uh, and the reason that I've taken a sort of look is for me, the direction, the shape, the opportunity structures that Southern countries have are overdetermined by what happens in what we could call the strategic centers of calculation, the places of power, the United States, so on and so forth. These are the places that set the pace, set the ability for places in the South to change on their own democratic accord. 
without sort of reforming the United States, I believe, and other sort of strategic centers of calculation, the types of domestic decisions uh, on how to uh, live together in a, community, in a community are otherwise desperately constrained. So the types of things I was looking at in capital state empire was the security state's encroachment on you know, affairs in everyday life, how there's the attempt to sort of weaponize and operationalize community uh, communication technologies to ultimately serve the state's interests rather than the than people's interests, rather than citizens' interests. This, of course, is consistent with the large um, path determinacy of the United States. Uh, digital coercion builds upon genocide, slavery, dispossession, the types of things that have been occurring in the Western Hemisphere since the 16th century. But the things that are added now is we have dragnet, digital surveillance, drone war warfare, and of course protracted conflicts abroad, whether it be little military adventurisms or long occupations in the case of Afghanistan. This is not just uh, the things that occur abroad, but there's a sort of a blowback effect too. Um, we see, and this has been made abundantly clear in the Black Lives Matter protests, that there's significant militarized policing of the most vulnerable. And we see ever more attempts to automate uh, activists, uh, organizers, people who otherwise dissent about uh, politics in the United States. And all of these things are sort of being done through computational mechanisms. And sort of many of these things are a little bit more abstracted or removed away from everyday experiences. So a lot harder to try sort of pin down. So it's this sort of uh, sets of concerns, this contemporary moment that we're in this conjuncture, as it were, that sort of my thoughts are sort of being organized uh, to and about. So it's with this in mind that I get to sort of talk today about uh, algorithms and the end of politics. I'm mostly going to be drawing from the first portion of the book, so the early chapters. Um, we're going to be talking about what's going on in the United States, because I think all of us have deep questions about what that society is doing you know, to itself, to its citizens, and the like. Uh, we're then going to talk about uh, computational social question, and we're going to then move on to a degree of theorization. You know, it's not enough to simply to know what's going on in the United States and how that affects other places, but we need to start to theorize about what, uh, what are the deeper mechanics, what are the deeper mechanisms, uh, what are the deeper effects on social relations that are sort of occurring. And the way that I try to do that is through uh, what Andrew Feenberg calls the critical theory of technology. This is very much a way of approaching and understanding technology from a Marxian uh, perspective. And they're going to provide a bit of a case study of politics by numbers, drawing upon sort of the sociology of development studies. Um, uh, and then if we have time, we're going to talk about how we might be able to sort of critique these uh, developments. Again, one of the things that one of the common themes through the work over here is that the United States is a society devoid, for the most part, of critique. So sort of it's very sort of one dimensional, as sort of Herbert Marcuse said. And so what kinds of uh, developments do we need to start adding, uh, particularly for us in the self, to try and sort of add some critique to this system? Okay, so what is going on in the United States? Well, you know, we could sit here and talk for three hours and not even exhaust 1% of what's going on. So in my perspective, the biggest thing that we can identify is a great acceleration of social inequality. I think that is the leading indicator of a considerable amount of alienation that's uh, occurring in, this, in that country, whether it be alienation uh, from people to uh, their community, to the state, to nature, or even to themselves. The deepest problem that the United States has is this degree of alienation that's uh, robust and enduring. Other types of things, social inequality, gender relations, racial relations, are emblematic of that deeper fundamental problem. Um, the U.S. has a very low degree of democratization to the extent that I don't think it can actually be called a democracy. That's not just simply just my opinion. There are sort of another, uh, a number of scholars in the United States at sort of some of the big Ivy League institutions that have done studies about the degree to which uh, its congressional and senatorial system is attentive to the needs and wishes, aspirations and desires of citizens more broadly relative to corporations. And the findings consistently show that uh, representatives don't bend to their constituent wishes in any way, shape, or form. 
we see massive differences between the 99% and the 1%. Just sort of give some basic uh, breakdowns of figures over here. To become a member of the 1%, you have to have a net worth of more than $4 million. The one, uh, members of the 1% hold 36% of all private wealth, upwards of 40% of all financial wealth, 40% of all stock, 60% of all business equity. And if we think about Trump's recent cabinet, uh, the members of the cabinet had more wealth than the bottom third of the United States uh, of all Americans combined. Um, I have a bit of a stat over here. It's a bit outdated. This is from 2017. It's clearly accelerated since then, particularly under the coronavirus pandemic of 2000 and early 2001. But the short version is that very few people in the United States hold more wealth than the other half. This is sort of a very disconcerting uh, development. But it's not just the 1%. You know, there's significant differences between the 1% and a 0.1%. And then, uh, you know, even sort of more granular than that. If we just keep it to the 0.01%, uh, to be a member of that particular bracket, uh, you have to have a household income of $111 million plus. There are 6,000 odd families that belong to this group and they have an average net worth uh, household income of $371 million. These are sort of astronomical figures. And in some cases, it's very hard for us to even wrap our minds around what this wealth does. To sort of give it a bit more graphical representation, here's a bit of uh, some graphs that sort of follow or visualizations that follow that show uh, uh, the extent to, to which there is uh, that the 1% has captured or holds, you know, the bulk of the resources in the United States, or certainly has a control over them. Now, we often think about, to sort of go back over here, the bottom 50%, who does that sort of comprise of? You, no surprise over there that it's increasingly racialized and gendered. Um, sort of graph over here sort of speaks about how the working class is likely to, or will become uh, with current trajectories, majority, minority in the next couple of decades. What that means is that more than 50% will comprise of black, Asian, Hispanic uh, persons. So when we talk about the working class in the United States, we shouldn't uh, uh, work under faulty pretenses that we're purely or only talking about white men. This is certainly not the case. The working class in the United States is very much a racialized, gendered, uh, or very much is composed of racialized and gendered elements. So how do we how have sort of people theorized this of late? So sort of pick a couple choice uh, theorists. We've had Fred Block uh, sort of after the Watergate stand scandal, you know, talk about how the ruling class doesn't rule. Sort of what he means by that is that the one percenters and even the 0.01 percent don't hold the reins of power per se they have they are principles and they use agents to execute their uh, agendas so the fred block over here is trying to uh, thread the needle on uh, a long-standing debate that doesn't really sort of crop up anymore between functionalist and intentionalist perspectives sort of more in a more contemporary uh, fashion uh, we have Batonsky and Chapelano's New Spirit of Capitalism, talking about how we've reorganized public space, how culture has become emblematic of uh, structural concerns, of how politics takes place. Coming after the wake of the 2008 recession, Larry Diamond talks about a global democratic recession, how there's a large uh, outcropping of authoritarians or de-democratization occurring. Uh, sort of, he puts this as a byproduct of the Great Recession, 2008 Great Recession. Similarly, we have Mark Blythe, who talks about global Trumpism, talking about how these populist right wing uh, movements are sort of capturing or becoming very competitive in electoral contests. Saskia Assassin talks about predatory formations, and here she's talking about entities like platforms. Uh, and particularly fintech platforms, the types of trading databases, trading mechanisms, Bloomberg terminals that end up as becoming what she calls a savage sorting of winners and losers. It's sort of the control of these uh, 
key technological devices that uh, allows one to succeed or fail in the United States. Uh, we have the AI origins of democracy and dictatorship, uh, sort of building upon uh, or playing up upon uh, other sort of work, uh, trying to figure out the, you know what are the con uh, under what conditions does a polity become democratic or authoritarian. This sort of view talks about how AI is going to effectively colonize all spaces, allowing those who have no qualms about human rights to best utilize them to exploit persons and then to control them better to undermine and subvert dissent and repression. This sort of like line of view is becoming very popular in uh, the American uh, press. A more sophisticated version is Jonathan Hopkins, who's had a book out this past year on anti-system politics, sort of using sort of contemporary uh, or sort of comparative studies of political parties in Europe. He's trying to sort of find out under what kinds of conditions do we have right-wing or left-wing populist movements uh, come about and what is their particular, and how does their manifestos and the content of their politics reflect to the conditions uh, in which their uh, state is organized. And the short version for him, he says when you start to look at it in a comparative fashion, it's not just the rise of authoritarianism more broadly, but rather that everyone has, or everyone, a significant portion of the population has lost confidence in neoliberal democracy. That this belief that technocratic governance, uh, that political parties offer complete elections based upon who can provide the best governance, who can provide the best service delivery, um, that has stalled. It no longer provides a, a, a political agenda where people can identify with something larger than themselves. Sort of a, a bit of a caveat to sort of his work. For him, right-wing or left-wing versions of popularism occur depending on whether a country is a debitor or, or creditor country. I think in, in different ways, all of these uh, have a good grasp of what's going on, but in their different ways, they're incomplete. I think that you, they are more broadly devoid of a larger organizing framework to understand what's going on. All of this that I mentioned, whether it be principal agent problems or sort of credit to debitor relations, start to get even more complicated when we start to add technology. So as the graph or as the image over here starts to represent, here in the last couple of decades, it's uh, information communication and technology companies that have, be, that have had the biggest share uh, within the United States market. Um, so these types of platforms, companies, whether it be Oracle, Google, Apple, so on and so forth, are now the prime drivers of the market in that country. And that certainly, certainly does something in much the same way that robber barons and uh, uh, railway barons uh, and oil barons in, you know, in previous centuries shaped the nature of politics in the United States. The same thing is true now with sort of big tech. It sets the pace, it sets the character, it sets the nature of the kinds of politics that occur. We see generally the de-democratizing effects of contemporary ICTs. I don't really want to uh, belabor the point over here because these are things that we hear in the news frequently enough that all of us should have a base level of similarity with it or uh, understanding of what an echo chamber happens to be, even if there is uh, not as much evidence as theorists would like about them. But we sort of see more broadly that the public sphere has been fragmented by special interest groups, uh, particularly those uh, that, have, uh, use, that are using their money from the big tech endeavors. We see the state and corporate surveillance practices that compromise human rights. We see market monopolies aiding in the concentration of wealth. Sort of in the last couple of years, we've seen big uh, uh, anti-monopoly movement in the United States. Sort of it's sort of very much sort of uh, building uh, um, uh, momentum. Again, we sort of have monopolies of, no of knowledge, so on and so forth. And all these types of affairs are cross, cross, uh, cross cut by race and class, sexuality and gender, capability, so on and so forth. But these de-democratizing effects of ICT need to be understood in a context of economic power. That's one of the things that sort of frustrates me a little bit about uh, existing critiques of media systems and technology in the United States, particularly that coming out of the United States, is that there's not enough attention paid to economic power. 
The reason I sort of say this is if we look at the work of Piketty, we see how societies with similar histories of technological change show such divergent patterns of inequality. We think of sort of his work in France and the United States, you know, France certainly has its problems and certainly has its problems around social inequality, but they're nowhere near as acute as the United States. The same thing is true of Canada, Britain, Italy, so on and so forth. So we do need to think about institutional and policy differences and how these come to shape, constrain, uh, or enable capital accumulation and the effects of that capital accumulation. For me, the key question over here is not the magnitude of labor's displacement by automation, which is ongoing and will be even more acute in the, in the years ahead, but rather that this automation, this, this joblessness, this mass unemployment is occurring without any of the social welfare policies that states had enjoyed in the post-war period. We see, and, and just a few bullet points over here, that there's a long decline in union membership and bargaining power. There's been a retreat of basic labor standards. There's very little enforcement of those labor standards. We have inflation targeting overemployment. And then throughout, we have this accumulated disadvantage and accumulated advantage, such that people who are wealthy, their families stay wealthy. Inheritances uh, ensure that those who are already rich stay rich. Within this, we see two broad clusters of explanations, ones that we can call sort of media centric explanations and ones that are sort of known more broadly as deep mediatization. Media centric explanations, to sort of keep it as, as, as simple as possible, say that technology is the driver, media is the driver. Uh, that that is what is occurring, that it's not necessarily the economic power, the, the context of economic power is a side effect. I don't necessarily, as you may have well gathered, I'm not sort of convinced by that explanation. I'm much more sympathetic to deep mediatization. Deep mediatization says that the media system, technology systems are the best way in which we can see this, all of these economic forces playing out. So in this perspective, we study big tech, not because of the types of products it puts into the market, but rather how uh, relations, of pro how property relations, for example, shape the products that are sort of put into the market. So it, we look at media systems to see questions of class, race, gender, so on and so forth, because these are sort of the easiest to see. Media uh, be, being sort of very apparent, open, visible, so on and so on and so forth, is the best way to see these grand uh, uh, forces at play. But there's a fundamental difference between saying that the media is a driver of these change, changes, or sort of being a place where these changes can best be seen. Going back to questions of wealth and, and who controls capital, in the United States, the rich direct the investments that shape the rollout of digital technology in finance, insurance, and real estate. This sort of means that they disproportionately have sway or influence in those societies, which means that their ideas, class expectations, and desires greatly shape the content of democratic life, or even if there is a degree of democratic life. So, you know, there is a considerable degree of difference between uh, what the one percent can do to shape the United States and what us in the 99% can do. Effectively, and sort of this is sort of a more of a polemical statement, Silicon Valley shareholders control the inescapable foundations of contemporary society. We think of all the types of uh, uh, devices that we have in our hands, and it comes from them. They control it through property rights, through pri private property rights regime. This uh, position gives them uh, great sway over public discourse and it has sort of other downstream effects. We're going to use sort of G uh, Jeff Bezos as a prime example of that point. We can see that through his uh, uh, combination of warehousing, logistics, online commerce, Amazon has grown into this behemoth uh, company. It, it's not so much uh, a company within the market as so much as it's almost becoming the market itself. Particularly in the United States, people purchased through Amazon more than any other platform. So sort of this accumulation of wealth allows him to do uh, philanthropy, so sort of like launder his image and so on and so forth, but allowed him to sort of purchase the Washington Post. So now, much like we have other 
press by philanthropy. The same thing is true of the Washington Post. So as he said, he was one of the few people that had the financial runway to allow the Washington <coughs> the Washington Post uh, its uh, its uh, its operations. Now that's not to say that he's involved in direct editorial decisions, but that does mean he gets to appoint the editors. Okay. It also allows his children to start on third base. Again, we see this, this idea of how accumulated advantages and inheritances perpetuate the system. They are part of the social reproduction of American capitalism. Um, during lockdown, as, as I'm sure you've seen in press reports, Amazon stock shot through the roof. Um, but their, their workers could risk either losing their jobs or contracting COVID-19 and putting their loved ones at risk. Um, that's a very uh, terrible choice set of choices. Amazon is notorious for its union busting. Um, and ultimately, when we start to participate with Amazon, we put other people at risk. You know, as I sort of like to say, Amazon is a Rube Goldberg machine of human misery. When I click uh, or put something into my cart, you know, sets of code scripts are put people uh, in uh, terrible working conditions or uh, keep them in terrible working conditions. We uh, shop where workers on a, in a warehouse are walking 20 kilometers a day without a bathroom break, or people in uh, southern countries are manufacturing goods and so on and so forth. The results of you know, capital controlling uh, the American polity are predictable, and indeed, I would say it's, it's unsurprising. The only people who would claim that it's surprising are those who are deliberately not paying attention. Some sort of basic graphs over here again to sort of visualize these changes. We see how up until the neoliberal turn that uh, compensation and productivity basically uh, kept pace with each other. They matched. Neoliberalism occurs, massive union busting is put into motion, wages stall, Union membership declines, productivity continues to rise, workers don't see the dividends of, those, of their productivity of their own work. Um, again, we see how union membership, uh, the decline of union membership is so related to shares and distribution. Without these types of collective responses uh, within, a, within a workplace, those who own through their equity, the business equity, the stocks, so on and so forth, are able to hoard their wealth. Ultimately, what we're talking about over here is control of shares between workers and capitalists. Sort of this is the grand industrial question, and it hasn't gone away just because there's big tech. It's the same, it's the same problem. This is the problem of modernity more broadly, or the, the problems of politics within modernity. Uh, two of the two great classes set the struggle for society. Here is the distribution of average income growth during expansions. Uh, again, we start to see what the neoliberal turn has done uh, to share and distributions. This goes up to 2012. As we sort of know, it's become even more acute this last decade. And again, greatly, uh, um, you know, there's a massive stratification now because of the pandemic. You know, stratification economics is back into fashion because of developments like these. Again, speaking about race and class matters, uh, when I first saw this chart, I had to take a bit of a, a pause and do my own investigation to see if this is true. Um, indeed, I, just as a quick aside, I submitted a paper to a journal with this information included, and one of the reviewers was like, wait a minute, is that actually, is that actually true? And yes. So what is true? is that the bottom 50% of black household wealth is worth less than a dollar. Worth less than 15 rand. So again, big tech is definitely, you know, capitalist control is definitely a racial and a gender issue. Sort of, I quite like this sort of graph over here, this visualization, just as a bit of a provocative uh, question. We see wealth distribution just before the French Revolution and wealth distribution in the United States currently at the moment. It begs the question of what uh, is going to occur, what is what is, is there going to be a snap, is there a way to sort of circumvent 
a snapping occurring? What types of mechanisms are being put into place right now to stop a snap occurring? In short, what I'm trying to point to is that the slant of the system in which big tech operates favors those who control it. That's the slant of the system. In not every case will the capitalists win, but it's in their favor. The system is designed to cater to the interests of capital above all else. It's sort of with this in mind that I say, uh, this is where our theorization must begin. You know, a lot of the work to date, this now is just description, but how do we start to understand these larger transformations at level of social theory? Okay, so with all of this put out, how, how best do we think through it? So to, be, to throw my hat into the ring of what I think is going on in the United States right now, particularly as its most recent uh, calamity, is that it faces an organic crisis. Sort of building upon Gramscian terms over here, an organic crisis is where the main parties, the main factions within the society uh, are aggressively competing against one another, but are unable to definitively defeat one another. So they're locked in a deep stalemate. They can't solve the problems that come their way. This is particularly acute in what I call long-run neoliberalism, because the, the winners and losers uh, you know, are so concentrated that it's become almost binary. You're either a winner or you're a loser. You're either in the 1% or you're within their agents that protect their wealth, or you're like those uh, black households that we uh, spoke about earlier, where they have less than a dollar of wealth to their name. So very intense competition. And we have intense intra-elite competition here because as sort of Marx said, capitalists must accumulate or be accumulated. And these sort of one percenters know that they must accumulate or be accumulated. That if they do not engage in protracted fighting, that they themselves may quickly belong to uh, the working class. Be, they may be, they themselves as individuals may suffer class decomposition. So ultimately within this organic crisis, the only type of reform we have is the reorganization of suffering. We see that very much in the United States uh, on their congressional floor, where by various sort of technical mechanisms, the budget must stay roughly the same. And if we want to add a program, another program has to go. They have these types of constraints upon their spending in order to uh, you know, keep this together. Uh, ultimately, this is the attempt by different uh, factions to retain or attain the commanding heights to set uh, the state to better cater towards their capital accumulation strategies. We see this for an example between oil billionaires and new sort of green tech billionaires. Um, you know, ultimately, oil billionaires, at least in my estimation, have been trying to delay the regulations of climate change because they're involved in capital intensive industries like oil drilling and so on and so forth, and they need time in order to uh, redirect their investments so that they will be able to better compete with green technologies. So when you have this protracted state stalemate, when you don't have a political system that can generate solutions, that can generate a uh, series of goods, that can distribute series of goods, or you know provide means of, of pathways for life, can provide good life chances for people, you start to have ex an extreme set of grievances and frustrations occur. Uh, there's a lot more going on too around race and racial grievances, uh, but we're going to bracket that out for the moment. In this case, I would say that Trump resembles very much this kind of Bonaparte type figure. There's a Caesarian backlash to this organic crisis. Um, the stalemate is so big and both parties are unable to provide a solution that it allows space for a third party to come in and try a new strategy altogether. And that's sort of very much Trump and his white nationalist strategy. Uh, so unable to manage contradictions that capitalism produces, it allows space for people like Trump to come in. Now, fortunately for the United, for the United States, Trump uh, was a very poor governor in the sense that he wasn't able to generate a sufficient legislative agenda that would be able to uh, keep this type of caesarianism in uh, form. But at the same time, we now have you know, the Democratic Party in power who aren't doing anything sufficient to ensure that Caesarianism doesn't come back again. 
you know, to sort of be very sort of like uh, flippant about it, the ways that sort of Biden and the government and he's lost in his first 50 days of his presidency is almost but ensuring that the Democrats are trying to lose, trying to lose the midterms, uh, you know, to try and sort of stall off seniorism, $15 minimum wage, reduce uh, student loan debts, you know, try to sort of push towards Medicare for all. All of these things are political winners, but it seems that Democrats sort of are unable to think in these types of terms. I don't sort of really want to get go down too far the rabbit hole of sort of Democrats and Republicans and their different conceptions of what a political basket of goods is and is not and how this is sort of used within politics. But that's sort of raw the the, the, the game sort of at the moment is that this close brush with Caesarianism, no one is really doing anything to limit it reoccurring. So again, the question is, what happens when you have a better authoritarian? What happens when a better authoritarian wins? And again, how might they use sort of computational resources? How might they use calculation to ensure that they keep on winning? So as I say, what happens when Caesarianism is aided, is added, is aided by computation? So I'm gonna sort of pivot now and talk about computation and the social question. By the social question, I mean the distribution of share of the share of wealth within a society. Okay, uh, we sort of well know that data and code are central to any to every facet of, of contemporary life. Code is not a tech, is not a technical neutral entity either. Rather, it combines two, two ontological registers: social demand and technical applications. That sort of social element there always means that ideology slips into code. Sort of philosophers of language and even sort of uh, uh, sociologists who speak about doxa and habitus know how um, there are, we'll call them biases, ideologies creep into uh, technical devices, infrastructures, institutions, so on and so forth. Code is an infrastructure as well as a social space of collective investment and bargaining over the terms of work. Like code is how we do our work. What ways do we do our work? Coding in a particular way means that the Amazon worker on the shop floor walks for 20 kilometers without a, without a bathroom break, or it means that he walks for five kilometers, has a bit of a break, is able to rest his legs, and then uh, work again. Effectively, code is a form of material governance. It's also one of these things that's a little bit abstracted away from us. Well, not all of us are, uh, have access to it, are privy to it, or able to change it. Ultimately, the deep problem that we face over here, if uh, Caesarianism and just generally the slant of the system in the United States continues, is that algorithms of oppression may automate inequality, which means that effectively we become locked in to these types of divergent uh, lifestyles. Within sort of the COVID-19 pandemic, we've heard quite a bit about this key divergence. Um, if, if algorithms of oppression are automated, that now becomes locked in. It becomes very difficult to change through legislative endeavors because now code is effectively law. It is beyond the reach and realm of influence by legislators. Yes, even if they wanted to try to influence it. So for me, I very much want to underscore that computation is a site of struggle and an instrument in a struggle, in that struggle. So while there's a considerable amount of discussion about the affordances, the affordances of technological devices, there's less discussion about questions of control, interest, and who they serve. In short, you know, and maybe sort of using some language here from my South African experience, the ruling class has captured computational resources and are using it to drive their agenda. Uh, these things are presented as depoliticized, uh, as this is simply just mathematics or engineering and that uh, what was previously a social question how do we politically engage with one another to discuss share and distribution now is going to be left up to those who encode uh, and the like the risk over here is encoded subordination again a type of key divergence we've been speaking about to move to a degree of theorization over here, I think what's going on is a great simplification, a great simplification. And I mean that sort of in two senses of the term. 
Uh, first is that as automation becomes more embedded into everyday life, so the realm, scope, and reach of our decisions uh, ever moves out of our orbit, out of our degree of agency, whether it be through mechanism design, choice architectures, nudges, so on and so forth. These thing, increasing decisions are being made for us. We think about technologies that are, are again, have a high degree of utility, you know, uh, Google Maps and how we use it to navigate spaces. And ultimately, this is decided for us by people sitting very, very far away. Concurrently, uh, the complexity of the technology increases, becoming ever more distant from a person's comprehension. Uh, and so without being able to understand these broader transformations, uh, people are now returning to very binary heuristics, friend or foe, Democrat or Republican, uh, these sort of very basic civil descriptions that now determine how we interact with one another rather than a deeper comprehension of the mechanics of everyday life. These distinctions, friend or enemy, democratic or republican, become amplified and they become very intense. And so there's a considerable exchange of these points of view, but that view is becoming ever and ever narrower. So there's an incredibly low signal to noise ratio. And throughout questions of distribution, of political economy, of sorting, arranging, of organization are beyond the ability of people to uh, shape them or talk about them. Instead, they become replaced by disputes, and I'm afraid I should probably have said here, quibbles over taste and inclination. Things that are sort of very much personal become uh, issues of political contest rather than things that are really political, which is about the organization of of goods and how they're distributed, the manufacturer, circulation, and consumption of goods. The second sense of the term of the great simplification is a kind of a contradiction that we that is now sort of emerging within capitalism. And that's notwithstanding ever technological complexity, because capitalism is organized through a system of a system of equivalences, the kind of things that we that Marx spoke about in the very first chapters of capital, you know, there's an ever greater simplification of the social world. The fatal abstractions of capital rule and the belief that there is no alternative. Between the system of equivalences and not being able to have a sense of agency over, over the political economy leaves people incredibly vulnerable to lapses in judgment. And sort of one of the most acute that I can, ones that I can think of is how we perpetuate a, a polity where carbon extraction is valorized, uh, but the same type of valorization is going to destroy almost all life on this planet within the coming decades. And we see, and very few of us do things to change that uh, path. For this great simplification, I think datafication is a good example of it. Datafication converts human practices into computational artifacts. We sort of know this through how Facebook uh, data scrapes our profiles and then turns them into uh, uh, marketable information that uh, advertisers then use to leverage us to buy this or that. They try to nudge us to buy this or that. Um, we see uh, all the resources of computational reason, which should be there for emancipation and liberation, are now turned to oversee human life. They become our overseers. And indeed, we now see an increased advocacy for an implementation of that overseeing process. HR departments want to, are moving, for example, away from you know, human uh, uh, labor making judgments over the performance of a person. And now you have a computer through its uh, machine learning or and its AI uh, looking at uh, your work, doing, a, doing an automated assessment of it, and then providing feedback. We, type, we see these things in sort of Airbnb, Uber, and so on and so forth. In short, we see how all of the things that, that give life meaning and purpose and value are converted uh, into bits and bytes stored on a hard drive somewhere in a server farm somewhere and ultimately being computed for profit. Okay. We see at the moment how capital is deterritorialized while people are re 
for example, through Swift codes, finance is able to move from here to there, but credit card data is uh, used to deny a person a visa to go travel somewhere else. They're worried that uh, you may not be able, that you won't come back. This is an instrumental distortion of all the affordances of computational reason. Again, to reiterate the thing that I said earlier, what should be used or what could be used for liberatory or emancipatory purposes are now simply used to prop up a capitalist regime in an organic crisis. Um, as we uh, invest computational reason uh, with more substantive decision-making powers, so we start to risk the foreclosure of politics. I'm not saying that we will no longer have uh, you know, state houses or executive bodies or so on and so forth, but rather it limits our ability to materially, and I really want to stress this word here, materially address questions of distribution, production, consumption that don't align with capitalist first principles. In short, what I'm trying to suggest over here is that capitalism is being encoded into computer code. Its values, its priors, its dispositions, its interests, if you will, to the extent that you can say that capital has interests, um, is, is being sort of encoded uh, into uh, code itself. And it very much limits our ability to advocate and try to implement a type of society that is not based upon capitalist first principles. So with this larger terrain, how do neoliberals understand technology? You know, for the most part, they have a good understanding, but not a great understanding. They um, are sort of well invested and understand how you know, data politics changes the relationship between states and citizens, how you know, scale and reach changes, that there's a reconfiguration of legitimacy, and they're sort of well aware of what happens when you have errors in data input. You know, they're all sort of like statistical garbage in, garbage out. Um, and so their types of uh, interventions are very much based upon trying to have diverse hiring practice, practices and better attention to the selection of data that are put into machine learning and AI programs. And they think that these types of changes will uh, make matters of discrimination much less acute. Uh, again, it's sort of very much aware that there's a high degree of opacity around that. And this opacity has uh, great, or well, because of this opacity, one is unable to even do an assessment about what the legacy's effects will be. And again, much like social contractualist theory, there's a degree in which they recognize that you can't opt out of it. This thing is, this, this is a car in motion and you're on it. The opacity comes through a private property regime. It derives from technical literacy. Lots of people don't know how to code, so on and so forth. And it derives from thinking that the technology is a sort of like black box. So there's not enough attention by scholars sometimes, or sort of by lay people, that understand that, that these technological devices have types of affordances, capabilities. And so they're very worried about how, you know, um, you know for example, AI is spoken about in this totalizing fashion. And these are sort of all very, very good points. But the problem is, is that they're partial and there's no real atten at attempt to understand them within a larger framework of analysis. I think this is where the critical theory of technology is, is particularly useful. Um, for myself, I would charge that data politics hasn't yet found a subject. In the, in the sense that like in a theory of industrial society understands that the proletariat is, is the subject of politics, that they have that they are the most exploited and so they have the most to gain by trying to reform the industrial system of production data politics hasn't yet found that you know we understand over here that technology is one of the major sources of public power at least within a critical theory of technology and this derives from modernity more broadly this isn't something that has occurred within the last 30 years it isn't just something that's occurred with the rise of big tech companies but rather about how machinery has been put into the production process for 400, 500 years. One of the things that we see within a neoliberal conception of technology or critique of technology is that there's a high degree of class obliviousness. So, you know, types of, some types of discrimination, of course, are bad, and there's a lot of attention to that, but class 
is something that's not really it, that isn't given its uh, full day in the sun. For me, I understand digitization as a kind of political ration, political rationality that tries to shape the labor capital antagonism. It tries to ensure that labor stays within its place, is unable to uh, use its power to use those affordances that technological devices provide and then use them for more liberatory, emancipatory manners. Um, for me, I think the radical critique of computation must begin with the register of capital. How is wealth that is put into the market able to shape social relations? How is it able to control how people move through their life? How is it able to shape their life chances? What is at stake over here is not just analytical precision. And again, analytical precision is important, but rather it's the attempt to generate a politically adequate way to understand how capital works within our societies. How you know, big tech is just the latest maneuver in how value tries to uh, colonize, for lack of a better word, all aspects of human life. So how is value restructuring societies and how does it cater to the imperatives of capitalist accumulation? No, that that uh, summarizes what I think sort of like the neoliberal conception of technology misses is how is this all is how is this how is the slant of the system shaped by the imperatives of, ca of capitalist accumulation and there are a couple of cautions over here one that i'll mention is that we need to be very careful about critiques that, that center silicon valley and the capitalist polity because too often they, these things can become through a through a magnifying glass they can become too totalizing they can become too deterministic rather what i'm trying to say is we need to see them as part of a larger totality. This gets back down to the point of deep mediatorization. What is the totality in which computation, calculation, and capital play? What is the larger terrain in which all of these mechanics are occurring rather than you know, the affordances of this platform or that platform? Um, I sort of note, note that uh, time is going, so I'm going to speak a little bit about politics by numbers, but the sort of the last half of the presentation, I guess, sort of maybe put a pause on, uh, we can maybe revisit that at uh, a different uh, time. Um, larger than sort of calculation, or maybe a sort of a, uh, attachment to calculation, we see how increasingly politics is done by numbers. You know, it's whenever, uh, say, the South African government commissions a report, it's the economists who have, their first, who have the first say, maybe the first and last say. It's what do the hard numbers say rather than the types of experiences that people on the ground may be having about the policies that are being put into motion. Numbers enjoy a central place in modern reason. They're deemed impartial. Uh, but I would say that when we start to think about politics as just simply you know, competing numbers or the competing production of numbers, um, we start to reify them. We start to reify the numbers rather than what the numbers represent. We put too, we invest too much attention into the numbers themselves rather than what they represent. For example, we think of GDP and GDP in South Africa in the last, in 2020, reduced by 7%. And we go, oh, well, that's horrific. And then we carry on with our business. But we don't think too much about what that 7% contraction may mean what that means for people's life chances, what that means for their quality of life, what that means for how they're able to best serve their needs, if they're able to even serve their needs, given that they don't have resources at their, uh, their, at their disposal. Again, uh, numbers are not a transparent representation of social phenomena. While we often think that and we say that we know that, our practices don't demonstrate that we put that into practice. Um, Indeed, when we think of politics by numbers, we tend to circumvent political disputes and replace them with technical disputes. This gets returns us to the point that uh, John Hopkins uh, mentioned earlier about how, you know, within a neoliberal era, political parties campaigned on who was able to be the best technocrat rather than what is the vision of society which they wanted. I think we can see this as indicative of the inversion of the Marxist analysis of the commodity form. In other words, this type of thinking about politics as being organized by numbers or orientated to numbers 
can't perceive the origins of items that are put into circulation. How are those numbers uh, constructed? How are they produced? And what are the effects when they're put uh, as they sort of make their way through public life? Uh, sort of the commodity form that sort of Marx points out, sort of there's this uh, artifice that we sort of all uh, put stock into, but it's very much a social process. process. Very rarely do we understand that numbers are the outcome of a social process at all. So I would put it to you that often what is seen as value free is rather value laden. It's not again in keeping with some of the, the themes that I've been speaking about. It's not simply neutral. These things are shaped by ideology, by habitus, by doxa, so on and so forth. So again, when we think of politics by numbers, we see the long-standing uh, concerns within modernity, how bourgeois thought is only able to concern itself with objects that are in isolation. We think of uh, you know, 20 yards of linen uh, in isolation from how they, uh, through a system of equivalences, they sit in relationship to other goods, other products, or even sort of labor process that produces those 20 yards of linen in the first place. Um, Bourgeois thought is uh, very much concerned with, you know, keeping the labor process out of, the, out of the equation, as it were, of keeping it out of the sphere of acknowledgement or recognition. So again, we see, you know, much like, um, you know, politics by numbers continues this larger trend within modernity of, thing, of thinking of things as disembedded, as discrete, as isolated from one another of divisions and so on and so forth. Um, I'm going to sort of put a pause over there, the gay sort of in, in the interest of time, and I'm sure you've heard me drone on for enough now, and uh, we're going to sort of then, uh, we can always revisit some of these things a little bit in a little bit more depth in the Q&A, so on and so forth. I know we didn't get to all of the things on my agenda, but that's sort of often the way things go, I'm afraid. Yeah, anyway, I'm going to sort of pause this now, and sort of allow us to go back to our, our open discussion. Okay. Um, uh, okay. Vanessa, can you put on my camera, please? Hi. Um, thank you, Scott. Uh, we are dealing with the technical issues. Um, just, I want you to see my face when I speak. Um, well, it, it wouldn't be a good communication studies lecture if there wasn't a technical uh, problem. Indeed, yes, yes. I, I believe that out of sheer modesty, I did not introduce myself uh, at the beginning. My name is Pier Paolo Frasinelli, and I teach in the Department of Communication and Media here uh, at the University of uh, Johannesburg. Uh, thank you, Scott. That was a rich, informative uh, presentation on issues that we do not go into often enough when we talk about artificial intelligence. Uh, here we talk a lot about the fourth industrial revolution, which I noted was conspicuous by its absence in your presentation. And I would like to know if you have any thought on that uh, um, periodization hypothesis called the fourth industrial uh, revolution, and you ended on how technology, um, and, and I think that's an important thought, um, is being approached not from the totality. And, and in fact, we have disciplinary divisions that actually does, do not help us to think critically about technology. I've recently attended um, a reading group uh, run by analytical philosophers and they were speaking literally a different language from yours. All the things that you threw up were completely absent uh, in that discussion, which is not to say it was a, uh, not an important discussion on issues of causality, uh, what kind of intelligence is artificial intelligence, how it works, uh, and so on. And if we were having a debate uh, with engineers, it would be a, another set of conversations that we would be having and, and, and um, uh, the same if we were talking with physicists. So I, I think, uh, or, or epidemiologists who, who are now starting to think about these um, issues. Um, and here um, we have so many things to think about, about how 
how this technology is socially embedded and you rightly pointed out that all technology always is socially embedded. This social embeddedness is not new, but it seems to be because of the nature of the technology, which has intelligence built into, we really need to think critically about how we see that relationship with capital, with socioeconomic relations, with power and so on. So thank you so much for this uh, presentation. And I want to um, open to the floor. I know that we have colleagues here who are working on uh, related topics um, from my department and, and school and also other people who do work on, on technology. So please, if you have any comment, critique, disagreement, or issues that I think we should uh, touch upon and that we haven't, um, please join us. I'm looking at the screen, waiting for a hand, or if you don't want to put up your hand, do unmute um, yourself and speak. Uh, we got plenty of time. And I agree with Scott that it would be nice to have a dialogical seminar with the contribution. And we already have our first contributor who is Nika uh, Maknik. Apologies if I didn't pronounce your name uh, correctly. Over to you, Nika. Uh, I'm Nika. I come from Slovenia, but I'm doing my PhD in London. Uh, thank you for that. That was really interesting. I really think there's uh, the need for a bigger shift, um, questioning like the money behind the media, which is really not happening enough in, I guess, media studies and also what I'm observing in I'm doing a PhD in politics and also there there's a really big absence of questions of inequality in, in relation to artificial intelligence. Uh, and my question would be to you, like you say that there is a need to talk about those questions uh, from a more economic perspective, but then I'm confused, why do you still stay um, as, uh, with national states as a prism through which you're analyzing these developments. I think you still focus a lot on the US, which I guess the fact is that mo the most uh, valuable companies do come from the US. But I'm kind of like, I would like to know how do you see this? Um, if you think that there's, only, there's a big importance that we still talk about nation states as like the places from which this comes from, or like federations or whatever or we should shift like our analytical attention um, elsewhere. Because I'm like, in my research, I try to understand like corporate power more than I try to understand the state or I try to understand corporate power within the within states. Um, and I see this as a big, like kind of like a lack or something in the research or like not trying to really, I mean, it doesn't really tell enough. My second question would be, do you see that um, as statistics is really important for the current, like, well, for the for the most important companies in the world or for analytics uh, itself. Uh, do you see that this also changes the state corporate dimension? Because like statistics used to be what kind of composed nation states, but now statistics is, I guess, um, the, the weapon of the most important companies in the world. Uh, so yeah, that will be my two questions. Thank you. Thank you. Nika, uh, what do you want to do, Scott? You have had two questions. You have my invitation to address uh, the fourth industrial revolution. You happy to go? Or do you want us to get one more? Um, no, I, th I think that's uh, between uh, Nika's two questions and your question about periodization. I can sort of speak a little bit and then we can come to the two that we have hands up and some others and the like. Okay, so me, off you go. Let me just jump in here. So, uh, Nika, I think those are sort of very, very good comments. Like, there would be something though I would say in response to uh, thinking about the nation state. My goal per se is not to, to reify the nation state or to say that this is it, uh, but I think there are a couple of realities that sort of need to be recognized. First, that this is the boundary of regulatory authority, and that definitely has a shape on what companies can be permitted to do in particular types of territories. So we still need to sort of keep that in mind. The other thing when it comes to the US, uh, and this is sort of underscore uh, something I said a little bit earlier, and maybe try and explain it a little bit better, uh, is that I'm not trying to think about the United States per se as a state, but rather as this imperial entity. And because of its imperial power, its scope, its uh, cachet, its clout, 
in institutional regulatory environments, uh, what what decision is made in Washington happens at the world uh, uh, at the WTO or at any of these other organizations. They set the pace. So the thought that it, that occurs in these major centers of power very much delimits what people are able to do in other parts of the globe. For example, when I was in the Caribbean, I had a look at how the, regula the regulations in that country were co copied and pasted from the United States because of the types of reciprocal agreements that they had signed, other types of bilateral agreements around content, media, property, and in the United States attempting to protect their, or, you know, have been encouraged as a polity to protect their IP and so on and so forth. So in many cases, it's about how this type of imperial power is able to protect IP, and, has, and IP is an example of property rights that have great significance for other places that, that around the world. So for me, uh, one of the things that I, that I think about is one must use all the resources of the critique of political economy to try and understand these types of polities. One of the things I try to think about is less about states as in isolation, but rather uh, about a polity. When I use the term polity, I'm trying to think of like its cultural, political, gendered, economic attributes that sort of combine to give rise to an imperial mode of living. What is what are the ways of life in which this polity, which comprises of all the things that I've uh, spoken about, uh, shapes people's experiences? Now, sort of in a talk like this, you know, one has to make selections about what one can talk about. And, you know, I have a tendency to drone on and on and on. So like, <laughs> there's some things I just had to put a bit of a pause on. Uh, transitioning to your question or observation about statistics, I think it's a, I think it's a wonderful uh, one. Um, the, one of the best books on statistics and how it was used in the state formation process, I think is the work is from Adam Tooze. He talks about the statistical collection done by the German state yeah, as a sort of a consolidated in the late 19th period. I think statistics, demography, have always had these relations to power. There's people who have power, who have, want, who have been interested in what are their subjects doing? How can we catalog, quantify? And some of these things are, of course, good, right? We've had demographers and statisticians in France, in Jeremy Dernty, that try to provide better civic infrastructure for people, like, you know, uh, sewerage, drainage, we need to know how many people live in an area in order to provide adequate sewerage, drainage, water resources and the like. So these things are certainly very, very important. Um, but I think your observation that uh, that big tech, as it were, has captured uh, statistical reasoning, data science, um, is the biggest sort of purchaser of skills in data science and like, is sort of very much setting the tone for what data science can be. Today, I think if you go to a good portion of data science departments, computational social science departments, statistics departments, demography departments, the number one goal for the students there is to get a job in a big tech company or startup and the like. Their sort of their ways of thinking, their aspirations, the way they envision their practice is set by the by sort of the framework of big tech and what they are trying to do. So I think your observation there is stellar and sort of very much on point. Um, I'm going to pivot now and talk about why I don't use the categories of the fourth industrial revolution. And I'm going to try to sort of be less flippant than I would otherwise be. Um, there's a theoretical reason and then there's sort of a, little, a bit of a polemical reason. Like I don't think we should, as scholars, we should allow our concepts, our categories to come from the World Economic Forum. Like, you know, they have a particular agenda of how they want to shape and organized discourse that gives credence to the, the way that they are proposing to solve that problem. So anyone who uses uh, Fourth Industrial Revolution, not as an object of critique, but is invested in this language uncritically, I am very, very suspect about, because I don't think they've done the intellectual work to really understand what's sort of going on. Uh, that's a sort of a bit of flippancy, but there is a deeper theorization that I have to it that justifies it in a, in a, in a parallel fashion. Sort of, I'm very much uh, swayed by Ernest Gellner's idea that modernity itself is constantly about reinvention 
of the basic means of production in a society, where other types of societies, feudalism, primitive societies, were very much static when it came to the, rev the revolution of their basic means of production. For Gaona, you know, modernity itself is characterized by re-revolutionizing those means of production on an ongoing basis. So I don't think sort of periodization really makes a lot of sense over here. And the same thing is sort of true by Ellen's Malcolm's Woods, who sort of, as a political Marxist, has had a very strident and very strong, and I think a very correct uh, discussion of why periodization within Marxism doesn't really make sense. We can sort of see this at the very dawn of modernity, where you have plantations in the Caribbean providing the initial surplus for industrialization in Europe. We can't say that one is an agrarian system and the other one is an industrial system. They're very much sort of combined. The same thing is sort of true of capitalism as it emerges across the globe. Periodization doesn't really make sense. Rather, it's a particular accumulation strategy within that place and that time as it's connected to other places and other times. So uh, back to the larger point, you know, speaking about discrete moments within modernity doesn't really make sense to me. I think it's just it's it's all it's all just modernity. Thank you, Scott. Um, and I, I will not uh, weigh in on on, on the periodization, uh, except to say that I agree that, like all concept, it needs to be interrogated. Um, now we have two questions: Are Ramanujan and then Teresa uh, Osha Kutlova? Over to you. Are um, yeah. uh, tell us your full name. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Ram. Uh, Ram is easy. Ram is from, I'm from India, and uh, it's uh, great that I got an opportunity to listen to this wonderful presentation and this discussion. I'm part of a group uh, in India which we call Politically Math. It's from the you know actually a mathematician. So many of us are involved in this group and trying to look at. Uh, uh, political economy and uh, these questions from from the viewpoint of mathematics and what it's doing to this. And in the process, we have been studying AI and uh, its impact on uh, labor and issues of that kind. Specifically, there are two things that uh, I want to uh, you know have your reaction on. One is uh, you know in uh, the presentation uh, there was something on labor, but I. You know, I would like to hear more on what this technology is doing to, uh, especially, I would say, the, you know, division of labor with respect to social reproduction of labor. And, uh, you know, the impact is, uh, I think, uh, something that you're going to see much, much more of. And I want to see more on that. Uh, another one is uh, the use of technology algorithms, especially for uh, mystification of decisions uh, at different levels. Um, you know, from the people's perspective, earlier, uh, I mean, I, I'm talking about, you know, field workers and activists who do work with the people um, could do certain things. But now, uh, you know, if you question something, it is, okay, I didn't, I'm not saying it, you know, and a, a computer is telling you this, you know, where, it's let's say Google Earth is uh, doing, uh, maybe I, I mean I can give specific instances. Uh, for instance, there was a farmer struggle where uh, they were doing something and uh, they were uh, uh, there was a drought and they were in India and they were doing some work and but they could not get assistance that was supposed to, they were supposed to get. And then the government says that oh your uh, index is uh, 1.8. Only if you're 2.2 you get assistance. Now, where is the 2.2 coming from? And then the government says, oh, we didn't do it. There's some complicated calculation, somebody, you know, uh, and actually Google is telling you this, et cetera, et cetera, right? So the more um, divorced these algorithms are, it becomes also means of power in, in terms of uh, you know, uh, keeping decisions farther and farther away. Uh, there's much more to say on that, obviously, right? But uh, I, you did talk about this, but I'm saying that. Uh, these are matters that, uh, especially from a Marxist point of view, I think would be more relevant. So, quite relevant. So, so. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, over to you, Teresa Kuldova. Hi, Scott. Uh, many thanks for a very interesting uh, 
presentation of your book. I uh, I am a research professor at the Oslo University, and uh, I have uh, <laughs> I've just received your book to review it. In fact, a few days ago, so um, I haven't read it yet, but I'm looking forward. And this was very interesting. And I also run a network which is called the Algorithmic Governance uh, Research Network, and we just got a couple of grants that actually deal with the um, with these kind of uh, topics. And uh, I think that uh, what you presented, it, it aligns uh, really fine with uh, all kind of critical work in algorithm studies, perspective of surveillance capitalism and so forth. And, and I really appreciate this uh, Marxist starting point, which we also have in the network. <laughs> and and uh, I was, uh, I, I haven't, as I said, I haven't read your book, but I noticed that you have a chapter on uh, misinformation and ideology. And, and on that note, I wanted to kind of ask you what your what kind of theory of ideology are you using since, since you kind of related to this uh, idea of misinformation and how do you connect the kind of systemic and structural uh, elements that you're that you're describing with this power of corporations and and and, and big tech and so on and that kind of as a mode of uh, elimination of politics proper and uh, and replacing it with this kind of technocratic uh, pseudo politics uh, at best. Uh, <laughs> so how do you relate it to, to subjectivity, right? Uh, if you, I, I come from a more of a Althusserian perspective on ideology. And, and what I think is interesting is to see how this kind of uh, logic of the governance by numbers or whatever you call it, or politics by numbers, how it is subjectivized on this uh, kind of individual level and how it is actually reproduced by, by our own uh, practices, right? Because I think what is interesting, you noticed, uh, you, uh, you, noticed you mentioned uh, uh, econometrics and this is uh, of course spot on, but you also have a huge movement to, towards, if you look at the HR, all kinds, of, uh, all kinds of technologies that are being developed, AI and HR and so on, it's, it's mostly driven by psychometrics, right? And behavioral sciences like this behavioral nudging and so on. And I think this is interesting if you relate it to, uh, to kind of Althusserian theory of ideology, which basically, or Zizek, right? It says like the, the ideology is the objective thing, right? So basically you could say that these uh, technologies, they understood that ideology is not in your head, but it is in the objective things that you're doing, <laughs> right? Uh, so if, if we effectively manage to nudge you in a certain way, well, well, then you the perfect ideological subject. And I think I, I kind of struggle with kind of explaining how this ideology reproduces itself despite so many people knowing how dysfunctional it is, right? Uh, so, and and I and I th and I think that you know you can see it very clearly in academia. In academia, we are full of people, uh, at least in the social and humanities, uh, that are kind of critical towards management by numbers, performance management, all all these kind of texts, right? Still, we are on platforms like academia, you do research gate, right? We are reduced to a number, uh, and we kind of are gamified in our subjectivity right so i think you know it would be interesting for me how you look at the relation between the kind of structural forces and the systemic forces and the and the individuals that you know are even critical but reproduce the ideology as such and from that i think the question is okay but how do you resist this if we are actually uh, reproducing these structures in our everyday behavior and the behavior is where the ideology is rather than what we internally think or we internally believe and so on uh, then then how do you break with that again you would have you could argue okay we can break with that with changing our behavior and kind of uh, manifesting our disbelief right uh, <laughs> so so but 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 I, I would like to know kind of your perspective on that and and I think I can finish with the question okay what is to be done if <laughs> <laughs> if, if this is kind of the, the form of uh, how ideology functions and how the power of the, of the economic power kind of relates to this ideology. So uh, because I think that, you know, if you consider it just a mere misinformation, or I, I'm not saying you're doing it since I haven't read it, but, <laughs> but this kind of uh, naive notion of ideology is kind of false consciousness, then, then we're not kind of dealing with the issue, right? So, so this is just, um, uh, yeah. <laughs> Thank Thanks. Thank you, Teresa. Um, over to you, Scott. Well, those are those are wonderful comments, questions from both Ram and Teresa. So what I'm going to try and do is speak to both of them, because uh, I think that from my perspective, there's a considerable degree of overlap, uh, whether it be around mathematics or psychometrics, so on and so forth. Um, sort of maybe sort of let me preface by sort of saying, uh, that the types of conceptions of ideology that I'm coming from are sort of very, very much sort of like 
the Western Marxist perspective. So I think there's a, a lot of value in false consciousness with, an, with maybe several asterisks as sort of going there. To me, the, the type of thing that I'm sort of more interested in when it comes to ideology is ideology as a form of mystification in the, in the sense that we don't really understand the types of the formation of the commodities in which we participate, our own labor, what our own labor is doing, so on and so forth. This kind of partiality of our thought um, that we aren't able to fully comprehend the abstractions that uh, we are engaging with on a day-to-day -day basis. That's not to say that there's no understanding, like clearly, as Ram sort of indicates, there's this, you know, the biggest protest movement in the world at the moment, you know, of Indian farmers who are pressing back against these decisions that are, that are being forced upon them. But again, it's a question of how are they articulated. Sometimes power is only able to listen to itself and on its own terms. You have to engage with it within a sort of a policy rubric or at particular places, particular types of consultation program uh, processes. And sometimes these are so far removed from the person who has the grievance. For example, we think about you know the Indian farmer who goes to uh, his local uh, state purchaser, for example, and the, the, the purchaser says, or the civil servant says, and we can't give you this price because the computer tells me otherwise. That these types of technological infrastructures have removed the discretionary judgment from that civil servant and you know, there's no way to sort of appeal or the appeal process is so convoluted, complex, or there's so many inequalities and barriers that effectively there is no way to really appeal that type of decision. Or if there is an appeal, the appeal takes so long, you know, it has to grind through the wheels of calculation that by the time it's resolved, the issue is sort of moot or it's sort of no longer, the issue is no longer uh, as pressing because the opportunity has uh, elapsed. Um, when it comes to questions of, of social reproduction, this is the this is an issue I think we need to pay much more attention to when it comes to the algorithmic organization of our social life. We know uh, historically that those the, those people who do social reproductive work. Uh, the labor isn't valued, it's not acknowledged, it's not given its due. And increasingly, if, if one of the only things that humans have left to do is sort of doing care work for one another, if, if sort of all if, you know, professions like being a legal analyst evaporate because of automation and AI, if the types of mechanical work, digging trenches, are replaced by other types of ma uh, machines and the like, you know, the only type of work that's really remaining uh, is sort of care work for one another. Uh, but again, that's the type of work that's not valorized, not valued, not paid adequately for, there's very little compensation for, if any. So this is a type of thing that I think... Okay, yes, yeah. okay uh, so these are the types of... <laughs> so, so these are the types of questions I think we really need to pay much more uh, attention to the um, social, social reproductive labor is going to become ever more squeezed and it may be the only thing left that humans are able to do for one another. So again, we think about the types of immiseration, mass unemployment uh, that's going to sort of occur. Um, pivoting back to questions of subjectivity, um, these things are, are clearly contested. Like we've just seen within the news, within the UK, when they had the algorithmic grading of all of the A levels, I believe, you know, people, uh, students took great a great deal of exception to how these decisions were arrived at because often they weren't based upon the types of trajectories that uh, the students had envisioned for themselves. I don't know the exact mechanics of how their A levels happen to work, but it seems that there's a high degree or uh, significant grievances that someone was aiming for an A, but they got a B, or all of their work indicated that they were going to get an A, but then they got a C because the statistical analysis of the postcode in which the person lived indicated that they were most likely to get based upon previous uh, data within the database and so on and so forth. So I do think that people are fundamentally trying to resist this and try to imagine themselves in different types of ways. We see how in the United States, Black Lives Matter ad advocates are very much trying to press back against the state uh, surveillance uh, infrastructures. How you know um, when uh, 
for example, uh, Trump's administration said that uh, Black Lives Matter is the biggest domestic threat, terrorist, domestic terror threat, sort of a number of Black Lives Matter activists and, and sympathizers pushed back upon that greatly because they didn't understand their challenge. They didn't, they knew that their challenge to the state wasn't based upon, you know, some uh, notion of terror, but rather issues of uh, justice, trying to get fairer, more equitable social relations, trying to ensure that the types of colonization that's occurred in the United States around how uh, police come and extract from communities of color uh, is not the way that they want to live and organize their lives. So I do think that people imagine different lives for themselves and they are organizing uh, themselves accordingly. Um, these things aren't set in stone per se, from my perspective, rather they are the types of contests that are occurring on a day-to-day -day level. When it comes to sort of what is sort of to be done, um, in many cases, there are sort of two things I would have to say about that. One is that all good critique tries to create conditions of possibility. That critique has to open up new ways of, uh, of people imagining how they could live with each other. Uh, so the practice of critique is to try find uh, where more conditions are possible, where different ways of being can exist. So that requires sort of putting critique in, into action. But, and again, there's a couple of sort of asterisks over here, sort of to make it sort of a bit more grounded. I think it's always too much to ask one person to, you know, I think it's also sort of like a grave misunderstanding of what's occurring, that one person themselves must be constantly invested in doing big structural change. Aside from sort of a burnout, like that misunderstands how, you know, social change comes from collective action and how people work together to try and imagine different types of futures for themselves. I think that sort of comes back in, but maybe, and maybe this is venturing a bit too far into Zizek territory that maybe I'm a little bit more than uncomfortable with, but it, too often we have this idea of social change as sort of like messiahistic in nature, that someone from the heavens will descend and give us the answers and give us the texts and, you know, be the figurehead for the, the life to come. But that's sort of not really how uh, things occur. And maybe sort of as a final way to wrap back to Ram's uh, question is when it comes to sort of mathematics and the like, too often we see mathematical procedures, whether they be in algorithms or whether they be elsewhere, as sort of Odon and Horkheimer said, they become rituals of thought. They become ways in which too often our policies, our institutions, our personalities just become, these become the habits of our mind. We fall into these procedures without genuinely thinking what they may be doing, what they may be accomplishing, what forces they're advancing, or what forces they sort of may be hindering. Anyway, I'm going to sort of put a pause on it there, and uh, I'm sure there's sort of much to be said, so we can always sort of go back and forth a little bit more. Thank you, Scott, um, and apologies for interrupting you. Uh, a colleague from Jaya, Zimorati, came into the room, I didn't realize my mic was on, and he started you know, commenting, and so I said, don't come into me, ask a question. So, Zim, over to you. Then um, I see there is no hand up. It would be nice to have at least one more. Um, if there is anyone come in. Uh, hey, Scott, and um, thanks, Pierre Paolo. We need to turn off your. And congratulations. You just need to mute people. Yeah. Um, thanks, Scott, for your presentation. And thanks, Piapolo, for uh, managing this. And congratulations for your book. Um, I saw your slides, uh, the statistical analysis that you showed in the beginning. And then your chapter on the politics of number. Um, and I was wondering uh, about the, um, the ways in which you have come to study this statistical analysis that is not yours. You simply take them and, and then study them. And um, how do you combine what you have taken and your idea of the politics of number? 
Um, and then there is this question that you raised in the beginning, which was that you had a Southern perspective as well as a Northern Southern perspective on these issues of algorithm. And uh, in the, what's going on in the US slide, there was just a reference to some people among them, Saskia Sassen. So I would like to hear you elaborate a bit more on this Southern perspective that you apply in this context. Thank you. Thank you for this. And I saw a hand up that then I think disappear and there's Tobias. Yes, please over to you. Yeah, thank you. Can you hear me? I guess you can. Okay, fine. Um, thank you very much, Scott. Uh, that was a that was a very interesting presentation, and I very much enjoyed reading. And like everybody else, I guess, look forward to reading your book. Um, I wanted to ask something which was very much related to what you started out with, which was much about the class structures of big tech. So um, you mentioned this with reference to to Gramsci about the kind of interregnum where two two groups will fight, nobody's strong enough to to kind of wrestle control from the other one. And therefore, we're kind of trapped in this um, dystopian present, um, if you want to put it that way. And I was wondering, especially when you were bringing up the issue of uh, green versus carbon, um, I was wondering to what extent it problematizes that kind of idea between, on the one hand, we know that many tech um, executives in particular are trying to rebrand themselves as um, the kind of um, as the kind of kind of purveys of a green future, we can see that in Google, we can see that in, in Amazon, uh, but we also know that they, for example, sell their cloud computing businesses and the capacities, uh, the capacities of those businesses um, to carbon extractive um, industry. So, to what extent um, do we, you know, there see dichotomy that very much is is more. Kind of fine grain that would be my first question the second one but you can absolutely sidestep that because i think it jumps uh, a bit ahead of the discussion would be to what extent um this kind of class perspective on tech changes once we take into account um the likes of alibaba and tencent in addition to the american big tech firms um and i'm saying that because i recently wrote something where a colleague said well you know um, you probably might want to draw some kind of line between Jeff Bezos and Jack Ma because whatever happened to Jack Ma would never happen to Jeff uh, Bezos in relation to the kind of chastening by the Chinese Communist Party. So if you would have any thoughts on that, um, those would be very welcome. Otherwise, thanks very much. Cheers. Over to you, Scott. Uh, perfect. So let me start off with... Uh, sort of the southern perspective. So in terms of types of anchoring literatures, um, for a lot of contingent reasons, um, I'm sort of very drawn to Caribbean social theory. So whether that be sort of uh, those who are very aggressively Trotskyist, like uh, C.R. James, or whether those be sort of maybe sort of Marxian or being informed by sort of Marxian perspectives, like Orlando Patterson, that type of thinking through the you know wake of modernity of the types of transnational connections the types of networks the types of uh, productive processes that span continents the types of long enduring effects of these types of uh, uh, entities so the types of things that sort of guide my thinking and the one thing that sort of caribbean social theory whether it be james or claudia jones uh sort of is very attentive to are sort of like what are the long 300 year tales of you know um modernity and if we had to think about sort of what big tech may sort of herald in the sort of coming 100 years for example sort of the imf you know routinely you know, puts out reports saying you know are robots going to you know uh, uh decimate social life the answer is yes they they have those types of titles that sort of routinely crop up they sort of indicate that the types of distributions, organizations of share at the moment will only return to the levels in uh, 1999 levels in about 100 years time. So if we had to think about the types of inequalities that we wrestled with in the later 20th century, you know, that might be, we may be thinking back and thinking, well, those, that, those were good times, right? Yeah. 
know, there's a there's a reason why the the Matrix, as a set of films, was set in the 1990s. That was a, maybe the high point of human development. Um, so, but back to sort of the, the perspective about uh, the, the the self. Like, the self is the place where imperialism is uh, felt most acutely. When it comes to weapons of war, uh, in many cases, it's southern people who are the bodies on which they're experimented upon. I have a book in my chapter towards the, sort of the very end called Test Beds of Authoritarianism, uh, which talks about how drone warfare is tested in Niger, is tested in Syria. These are the types of technological devices uh, about sort of signature strikes, automated um, targeting software from real-time data inputs that are drastically different from the types of signature strikes that were occurring in the Obama era. So ever increasingly, it's, I mean, well, you know, it's consistent with sort of modernity more broadly. The southern populations are the, are the places where the violence is most acutely felt. Um, I don't know necessarily, need, I don't know if we need to, um, you know, you know, there's sort of very sort of strong southern critiques of sort of what's going on in the United States at the moment. And I'd like to think that sort of I've tried to sort of add my add my voice to it, uh, recognizing there's a huge diversity and plurality within, you know, what is called sort of southern theory, um, uh, from those sort of very hostile to Marxism to those who are accommodating to those that have signed up for it. Uh, pivoting to the class structure of big tech, uh, Tobias, I think that your argument about like the need for sort of a fine-grained analysis, I think, is is, is spot on and one that I I, I fully agree with. Um, we see again sort of like big tech, these workplaces as sort of sites of, of struggle. We see how just you know uh, as a sort of very good example linking to the issues of warfare, how during Project Maven, Google employees took exception to how their work, their coding. Their labor was being unfolded into these imperial actions that were sort of taking place abroad. How Google itself was trying to use this as an entry point to try get the big Jedi contract on who was going to be the cloud computing, and who's going to provide cloud computing for uh, the American military, a ten billion dollar contract. So, um, in Google's case, there's there significant pressure by sort of you know these highly skilled workers, and again, sort of their highly skilledness makes it a bit much more likely that their voices were sort of heard on this matter. That Google end up sort of retreating away from uh, uh, competing within that Jedi contract to again sort of be provide service space for you know the American Empire and the like. Um, the one thing that sort of your comments sort of struck a chord with me on is. Uh, servers and and Bitcoin. I don't. So I found out about this a day or two ago. So I apologize if I'm late to the party. But increasingly, there's this thing called crypto art, and I don't know if you're familiar with it. But crypto art is digitally produced art that that tries to reduce all of the affordances that the digital provides. Like the digital allows like multiple copies, so on and so forth. We all know that, right? But crypto art is using the blockchain to ensure that there's only one copy of this particular artwork and that it's verified to belong to one particular person. Now, of course, as you know, the types of uh, ledger uh, uh, an organization that occurs with crypto art, this one transaction of this one, of this one artist selling to this one buyer produced you know, uh, four times the amount of a transatlantic flight in terms of carbon usage. So when it comes to uh, these types of, you know, on the horizon types of technologies like uh, uh, blockchain and the like, you know, we always see that there's a kind of a celebratory, you know, emancipatory uh, kind of discussion there, but it's something that gets just like how much carbon tra tracking all these transactions takes place. Um, now, you know, um, then again, this is something that sort of worries me considerably given just how much, you know, esteem there is for blockchain within Silicon Valley more broadly. Like, you know, I still don't quite understand, and maybe this is sort of my ignorance over here, but why someone like me, Elon Musk, would really want to get in to, to blockchain? Like, it doesn't really make sense to me. Like, it kind of makes sense to me, but it doesn't really make sense to me, given, you know, all the types of greenwashing that, you know, he and his brethren are trying to do. So, yeah, uh, 
that's something that's sort of the sort of very confusing. Maybe you, you sort of have a response on, on that. When it comes to sort of class in China, like, uh, you know, I studied a little bit about China and there's some stuff that, you know, ultimately got left out of the book because at some point you just have to realize, like, you don't know enough about this to publish it, right? Like, so you do your own uh, research and you, you sort of know enough about uh, this and that and the types of citizen scores that have been put into place and, you know, you know so on and so forth and, and the sheer type of state investment into it. But like, you know, at some point that's beyond my expertise, I'm afraid. So I get to very much punt on it, I'm afraid. Thank you, Scott. And thank you everyone for the debate. I see no hand up and that's fine too. Um, is this thing called screen fatigue that kicks in and no matter how rich and exciting the conversation is, uh, I predicted one hour and a half, we are almost to two hours. Uh, so thank you everyone. Uh, thank you particularly for Scott for giving us the opportunity to think critically uh, about artificial intelligence and its relationship with uh, uh, capitalism and, and to start thinking about categories within the political economy and ideology to, to address these um, issues. I want to end with two brief announcements. One is something that is happening in Johannesburg. I want to share it for with people who are far away and also with colleagues and uh, who are here. This morning there was a demonstration outside uh, in Bramfontein organized by students at the University of David Vatesran and one person was killed uh, during the clashes with the uh, police. It's a tragic event. Some of you might have seen it in the news and we are now trying to set up a meeting with some concerned academics to uh, try to think uh, uh, about what's going on, where a group, small group of students organizes a protest and, and you have a person dead uh, by the end of the morning. I think it's tragic and also um, symptomatic of uh, what is happening in South Africa, especially in relation to policing. Um, the second announcement, uh, which is much less uh, tragic, is about um, if you have joined the seminar and if you want to stay in touch with the Johannesburg Institute for Advanced Studies, we have an email list and you will be informed of the very many important seminars and initiatives and that we organize. Please send a message to Vanessa. Uh, she's the person who um, gave you the access to Zoom. And if you are not on the email list, if you send her a message, she will add you. Thank you again, Scott. Thank you again, everyone. Uh, have a wonderful evening. Uh, usually at the Journal Institute for Advanced Studies, we would invite you uh, for a glass of wine. Uh, some of us might end up uh, having it, but have one at home uh, and have a great evening and goodbye. Thank you so much.